Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today as part of the National Cervical Health Awareness Month. I'm going to talk to you about cervical dysplasia or cervical precancer and cervical cancer. So just to start, we'll kind of quickly review the female reproductive organs to put the cervix in context. Um, so this photo first, you'll see the ovaries. So uh, women have two ovaries and that's where eggs or oocytes are made. And the ovaries kind of connect through the fallopian tubes to the uterus. And then the bottom of the uterus or that lower part is what we call the cervix. And then uh, below that is the vagina and the external area is called the vulva. So if we think about um, the places or organs or disease sites where women get cancer, we can look at the 2017 estimates for new cancer cases in the U.S. and estimated cancer deaths. And you can see that if under new cases, the only gynecologic cancer that makes it onto that list uh, with number as number four is uterine cancer. So uterine cancer affects about 60,000 women a year in this country. If you look below, these are estimated cancer deaths in the U.S. You can see that ovarian cancer is the uh, gynecologic cancer that causes the most death, deaths annually at about 14,000, uh, followed by uterine cancer um, at their number five and six with about 11,000. Interestingly, cervical cancer doesn't make it onto either of these lists, which doesn't mean it's not important, um, but just so you can see, I think it often gets sort of overlooked when we're thinking about gynecologic cancers because it is less common than ovarian and uterine cancer. So just looking at uh, estimates for all three of these cancers on the same slide, you can see uterine cancer, as I mentioned, about 60,000 new cases a year and 11,000 deaths. Ovarian cancer, many fewer cases, only about 20,000 new cases a year, but more deaths uh, with about 14,000 a year. And then cervical cancer, much less common, um, with about 13,000 new cases in this country and contributing to about 4,000 deaths per year. Think of this, though, in the context of the larger world. So this map shows cervical cancer incidence. And so as the shade of blue gets darker, the incidence of cervical cancer rises. So, you know, if you look at the U.S. stats, you might think that cervical cancer isn't really a problem, but it's important to remember that cervical cancer remains a tremendous problem. It's just a problem that is really largely affecting more developing countries with the highest disease burden in southern parts of Africa and South America. This is a similar map showing cervical cancer mortality, which really mimics uh, cervical cancer incidence with the same countries and same areas having the largest burden of disease. And this is another image from the World Health Organization looking at the incidence and mortality of cervical cancer uh, by uh, location. And you can see uh, Northern America all the way at the bottom. So again, for people in this country, we often sort of don't think about cervical cancer because our rates are so much lower than other parts of the country. But this remains a very, very significant uh, problem for women worldwide and for women who are affected by it in this country it remains a very significant problem and that's what we'll talk about now. So 85% of cervical cancers occur in less developed regions and why is that? Um, the sort of going hypothesis is that this has to do with screening programs so our ability to detect cervical precancer and early cervical cancer and also the presence of programs for HPV or human papillomavirus vaccination, and we'll go through these in detail. So let's sort of think about the natural history of cervical cancer. So almost 100% of cervical cancers are caused by an HPV infection. HPV is a virus um, that is in general sexually transmitted, um, although it can be transmitted through non uh, sort of intercourse we know anytime there's mucous membrane touching mucous membrane, you can have transmission of HPV. Um, HPV infection is extremely prevalent. We think that about 90% of sexually active people will have an HPV infection. The majority of those people will be able to clear the infection with their own immune system, but there will be a minority of people who cannot clear the HPV infection and HPV will remain in the cervix and in the area and cause cellular changes. And those changes we cannot see on testing and that's called cervical dysplasia or cervical precancer. And the majority of cervical dysplasias and cervical precancers will actually 
cause no problem and many will resolve even if we did nothing, but there is a small subset that will then progress to cervical cancer. One of the amazing things about this whole process is that we think it takes, for most patients, at least 10 years to go from your initial HPV infection to a diagnosis of an invasive cervical cancer. And that's important because it means that we have many, many sites along this diagram in which we can act um, to kind of prevent the initial HPV uh, infection from turning into a cervical cancer. So for starters, what can we do to prevent HPV infection? Well, I'll start by saying that probably very little we can do because as I said, 90% of sexually active people will be exposed to the HPV vaccine. So we think it's sort of synonymous with being sexually active. But we can educate um, about sexual practices. We know that early age of sexual activity seems to be associated with higher rates of HPV infection, having multiple sexual partners or high risk sexual partners. We know that having other sexually transmitted infections increases the risk of acquiring HPV. This is a phenomenon we've also found in HIV. So if you have other infections or other breaks in the skin or the mucous membranes, that makes it easier for viruses like HPV or HIV kind of enter and transmit across um, that skin. Um, immunosuppression is a very, very important risk factor for HPV infection and cervical cancer. And immunosuppression can take the form of HIV infection, which is one of the most common types of immunosuppression that we see. But also there are many, many women who are on chronic steroids, either for rheumatologic disease or women who've had a tr an organ transplant and require lifelong immunosuppression. And so because I mentioned it's our immune system that we rely on to clear our bodies of HPV, if we're actively giving medication to suppress the immune sy system, so steroids, that can make it very, very difficult to clear HPV and put someone at increased risk for having persistent HPV and a cervical cancer or precancer. And then finally, one of the most important modifiable risk factors is tobacco use. So women often ask me, you know, once they have an HPV infection or if they're worried about getting one, what can I do to kind of prevent from having cervical changes or cervical cancer? And I say the most important and easiest thing you can do is to avoid tobacco use. Tobacco makes it very, very difficult for the immune system to clear HPV. How do we prevent an HPV infection? The best, really the best way, apart from you know, education on safe sexual practices, is HPV vaccination. In 2006, the FDA approved a vaccine called Gardasil uh, for uh, HPV. The initial vaccine covered four subtypes. So HPV is sort of the family of viruses, but there are multiple different subtypes. Um, they, we usually group these subtypes into the cancer causing. So there are a group of subtypes or specific types of HPV virus that can result in a cancer or precancer, and then there are a whole different group of HPV viruses that can cause things like genital warts, or we also call that condylomas. The first vaccine, which was approved in 2006, covered four HPV subtypes, 6, 11, 16, and 18. 6 and 11 are known to cause genital warts. 16 and 18 are the two most common cancer-causing or precancer-causing subtypes. More recently, in 2014, the FDA approved an updated version of this vaccine, and this is the vaccine that is currently available, and that covers nine HPV subtypes. So it's the four from the initial vaccine, plus an additional five HPV subtypes that are known to contribute to cervical dysplasia and cancer. The HPV vaccine has been recommended by the US Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. It's approved for males and females. That's something people don't realize because they think of cervical cancer as a, a disease of women, but HPV is carried by men and it's transmitted by men. And so this, uh, this vaccine is actually approved for men and women and recommended for both. It's approved between the ages of nine and 26, and it's recommended um, to give the vaccine at age 11 or 12. And importantly, uh, the goal of this vaccine is to give it before becoming sexually active because you can only prevent the HPV infection if a person has not already been exposed to that HPV. The dosing schedule, so for um, people nine to 14 years old, there's now a two dose approved regimen. It used to always be three doses, but we now think two doses is sufficient. Um, and for women aged 15 to 26, they're actually a three dosing regimen. So the first shot would be given, let's say today, and then there would be another shot in two months, and then another shot in six months. 
So how are we doing? This vaccine has been available for over a decade right now, and how we're doing, and the answer is um, sort of upsettingly not that well. So we know that only about 60% of eligible females can complete the first dose, only about 50% are completing the second dose, and only about 40% are completing the three-dose regimen. And we can compare this to other vaccines that are given to adolescents, like the meningococcal or the tetanus diphtheria pertussis vaccine, where uptake rates are about 80%. You can see sort of these uptake rates are really dismal compared to that. And why is that? You know, if there's a vaccine that can prevent cancer, why isn't everyone getting it? And, you know, no one knows the exact reason, but we believe it's probably a myriad of reasons, um, likely relating to pharmaceutical marketing, a vaccine schedule that requires two to three doses based on your age, concerns about safety and side effects. There's also parental concerns and attitudes about a vaccine that's associated with sexual activity and a sexually transmitted infection, and then also the way that the vaccine has been portrayed by the media. Studies have shown that the most important thing sort of contributing to uptake among women of the vaccine and among men is sort of their interaction with healthcare professionals. And so I think I always tell healthcare professionals, no matter what they do, if you um, sort of believe in this vaccine, then it's our responsibility to make uh, patients, parents, grandparents all aware that this vaccine is available and recommended. Um, and from the data we have, it is not dangerous and highly successful. And so this is really our responsibility in the healthcare profession to kind of push increased vaccine uptake. So back to cervical cancer prevention. So we talked about how we can prevent HPV infection. So there's education about sexual practices, education about increased risk among certain groups of patients, like patients with immunosuppression, and then HPV vaccination. What else can we do? Um, let's, you know, let's say we meet patients um, who have already been exposed, which are gonna be the majority of women in this country who will be exposed to HPV. What can we do to prevent that HPV infection from turning into a cervical cancer? Well, we know we have this sort of 10 year lag period, and so we think there's a lot we can do. So the first thing that I'm gonna talk about is the cervical cancer screening programs. So many of you probably have heard about a pap test. So on this diagram, you can see it's a little hard to see, but sort of the belly is on the top of the screen and the back is on the bottom of the screen, and that's a speculum. And so in a gynecologist's office, a gynecologist could place the speculum and you can visually see the cervix, which on our diagram was the lowest part of the uterus. And we actually can take um, a sampling of cells that are exfoliated from the cervix and then review those to see if there's any evidence of a cervical precancer. Um, this is called the PAP test, named after Dr. Papa Nikolai, who actually was at uh, did all of his research and made his discovery at this our very own hospital. In the past, we used glass slides, um, and this was called the conventional pap test. This is largely being replaced by what's called the liquid-based pap test. They have the same efficacy, but it's a lot easier to transport. Um, basically, it, the cells suspended in this liquid in a plastic uh, bottle versus a glass slide. And as we'll talk about more in a moment, you can actually do HPV testing and testing for other uh, sexually transmitted infections when we have these cells suspended in a medium in this plastic tubing. So what I talked about before is called the PAP test or cytology testing, where we're actually looking at cells from the cervix. So that's one method of screening. Another method of screening is just looking for the presence of HPV and looking for evidence of HPV infection. Because I mentioned we think almost 100% of cervical cancers are caused by HPV, so we think HPV is a necessary precursor to cervical dysplasia. So if we test for HPV, that's a good surrogate of sort of risk for cervical cancer and cervical precancer. There are currently multiple FDA-approved tests that are available in the US, and actually there is a, a method of screening with just HPV and not doing PAPs that's now been approved. Um, different tests test for different HPV strains. As we uh, spoke about earlier, there are multiple different strains of HPV that are known to cause cancer and precancer. And so some tests will tell you exactly which strain you have. Some tests will just tell you whether or not one of the highest risk strains are present. And currently we don't know of any, you know, any single test to be the best, but in general, we're doing a combination of HPV and PAP or cytology testing. So the ASCCP, um, along with uh, obstetrics and gynecology and gynecologic oncology uh, groups have put together consensus recommendations on cervical cancer screening. 
and the current recommendation is not to start screening for women less than 21 years of age. The reason for that is, as I mentioned, HPV infection is extremely common, and so it's very likely that these women are going to have an HPV infection, but the immune system is very robust, and the majority will clear on their own, and even in those women who the disease is not going to clear or resolve on its own, cervical cancer grows very slowly, so we believe we'll find it in time before there's really any serious damage, and so currently we do not do any screening for women less than 21. For women 21 to 29, we do cytology, that's PAP alone, every three years. We don't do HPV screening because again, HPV is so common in this group of patients that we would be finding very high rates of HPV that are probably not clinically significant because the majority will clear on their own. Once a woman reaches age 30, the recommendation is to do what's called co-testing. So that's HPV with a pap test every five years. Assuming that they're normal, then you can continue on an every five year regimen. And then once reaching 65, or if a woman has a hysterectomy for something that's benign, like fibroids, then she can stop pap screening altogether. Now this has raised sort of a lot of questions and concerns because in the past we've recommended paps every year and that was part of a woman's normal health maintenance. They would go to their gynecologist every year and get a pap. And one issue with not doing paps every year is it's easy to kind of lose track of when your last pap was and five years can easily turn into six, seven, nine, ten years. And so we really have to be vigilant about sort of explaining to patients and to practitioners, because these recommendations can get very confusing, how often PAP should be done. And the other thing is, just because you're not getting a PAP doesn't mean it's not important to see your gynecologists. And most gynecologists still recommend an evaluation every one to two years, even though the PAP is now not part of the annual exam every year. Just to reiterate, HPV screening is a very useful tool but we're not using it as part of routine screening in women less than 30 because we know how prevalent HPV is and it does not seem to be clinically significant because the majority of women will clear it on their own. So how does screening work as far as results being normal versus abnormal? So if the PAP and or the HPV, depending on the age, is normal, then a woman would just continue with the routine screening that we discussed. However, if the PAP or the HPV is abnormal, then we move on to the next step, which is uh, colposcopy and biopsies. So colposcopy is a procedure that's done in the office where we look at the cervix again, similar to with a pap, um, but we also put a solution on the cervix that can outline whether cells look abnormal and are more likely to be precancerous or cancerous. And then we look with a microscope that we have available in the office and then biopsy anything that, that looks abnormal. And we biopsy it and we send it to, we have a group of pathologists and cytologists who are dedicated to this type of um, evaluation, and then they make a suggestion or they make a diagnosis based on the tissue or the specimen that we send to them. As I mentioned, one of the issues with cervical cancer surveillance have been a change in guidelines and these multiple long intervals of screening that can be confusing as far as when you have to come back. Another issue that has led to some confusion is we have multiple different grading and scoring systems. So I've outlined on this table just a couple of the classifications used, and if you look at different cytologists or different hospitals or institutions or labs, you might see very different um, description of results for the exact same PAP test. But in general, there's either a three-tiered or a two-tiered system going from mild to moderate to severe. Um, sometimes that's called CIN, which uh, stands for cervical intraepithelial neoplasia, or the new terminology, which is the Bethesda two-tiered system, which calls things low-grade squamous intraepithelial lesions, or LSIL, and then high-grade squamous intraepithelial lesions, or HSIL. And in general, you know, we used to believe that cervical cancer went from an HPV infection to a low-grade lesion to a high-grade lesion to cancer um, in a stepwise fashion. We now think that there's probably kind of two separate forms of dysplasia. There are probably these low-grade lesions that we can refer to as LSIL lesions, that will heal themselves or kind of just stay low grade and never really cause a problem. And a, probably a total separate entity, not a progression of this, are these high grade lesions or H cell lesions. And these are the ones that we really worry about and these are when we intervene and we think that an intervention can prevent development of cervical cancer. So these are just a couple of biopsies so you can get a sense of what a pathologist or cytologist is gonna look at um, when we send them specimens that we take in our office procedures. So this is a biopsy of a cervix that's completely normal. On the uh, 
left side of the screen, that's a biopsy. On the right side of the screen, that's a pap test. So you can see this would be a low-grade lesion. And you can kind of get the sense that in that area right where the cells become darker, um, those are where the cells sort of look abnormal, but the darkness is only extending about a third of the way up the screen towards the surface, and so that would be called a low-grade lesion. We can compare this to a high-grade lesion where you see all of the cells look very, very dark and abnormal on both the pap and on the biopsy, and so this would be suggestive of a high-grade lesion. And then finally, this would be a biopsy of an invasive cervical cancer, and these are biopsies, again, that are done in the office. And you can see that the cells look very disorganized. There's loss of all normal architecture, and so this would be sort of a very clear example of an invasive cervical cancer. So getting back to our cervical cancer prevention model, we can prevent HPV infections, and then if we can't prevent the HPV, so the, the woman has already been exposed to HPV, we can prevent the HPV from turning into a cervical cancer. And we do that by pap screening, HPV screening, colposcopy, and cervical biopsies. And the goal of all of those is to catch an early cancer or to catch one of those high-grade lesions so that we can intervene. And what interventions are possible? So we usually group our interventions into two groups, ablative procedures and excisional pr procedures. So ablation means you're just destroying some of the cells on the cervix. So cryotherapy um, is a commonly used therapy where we actually are essentially freezing cells on the outside of the cervix. And then we can also use laser, a carbon dioxide laser. Excisional procedures are very, very commonly used. You may, have, you may have heard of these in the past, but the most common is called a LEAP or a LOOP, electrosurgical, electrosurgical excisional procedure or a cold knife cone biopsy. So a LEAP, which is probably one of the most common procedures that uh, we perform as gynecologists and as gynecologic oncologists, involves using a loop that is electrically charged to remove just sort of the outer part of the cervix. And this is a combination of an ablation because you are using electricity and excision, so you are removing tissue and you can examine that tissue under the microscope and be certain that what you're removing is not a cancer or if it is a cancer, you will know, you know, you can know whether or not it extended any deeper than you thought it did. So you kind of move this loop across the cervix and that removes a piece of tissue, which you can see here. And then the cervix actually heals very, very well. And often when you re-examine these patients in a couple weeks, there's no evidence that you did anything. Um, this is, can be done as an office procedure. It can take under 20 minutes. A cold knife cone is a procedure we usually reserve when we're more concerned about a cancer or if we know there's a cancer. And this is actually taking a scalpel and removing a cone-shaped piece of the cervix. And this is done usually in an operating room, but also a minor procedure. So we kind of go from abnormal PAP or HPV to the colposcopy with biopsies. And if those biopsies show a high-grade lesion, then we're often doing an excisional procedure. So I've kind of mentioned the benefits of the excisional procedure are to eradicate this um, basically precancerous lesion from the body or to diagnose the cancer so that we can then manage the cancer. But there are also um, sort of unintended or negative consequences of these excisional procedures. And you know, there's bleeding and infection, which can happen with any procedure, but we're very, very concerned also about the obstetrical risks because as I mentioned, HPV infections are very common among women who are in childbearing years. So having, removing part of the cervix, and if you think back to our diagram, the cervix is the bottom of the uterus, and that's sort of the, what's partially what's holding the baby in the uterus during a pregnancy. So taking out part of that cervix increases risk for first trimester pregnancy losses, then also preterm labor, or going into labor before we hope a patient will, preterm delivery, and that is associated with neonatal morbidity and mortality. And so we're very cautious about how many excisional procedures we do, and we really try to avoid taking out pieces of the cervix if we don't need to. And that gets back to our screening recommendations. You know, part of the concern with doing HPV testing on all women of all ages is that we're gonna find a lot of these abnormal results, and then we're gonna feel pressure to act on them, and then we're gonna end up taking out pieces of cervix and causing women to have these negative obstetrical outcomes years later when they're ready to become pregnant, when the majority of these HPV uh, infections and early lesions would probably uh, resolve on their own without our intervention. And, and sort of it's our understanding of this careful balance between risk and benefit that's led to the current recommendations and our hesitance to be too aggressive with uh, early cervical lesions, especially in young women. So that kind of 
is sort of the end of my discussion on the management of cervical precancer. Now we'll switch focuses and talk about cervical cancer. So for some women, that biopsy that we do in the office or that excisional procedure will show a diagnosis of a cervical cancer. So we sort of start with the diagnosis of cancer, and then the next step is to determine what stage the cancer is. So in, in cancers of the reproductive organs, when we talk about stage, we're often thinking about surgery. We take a woman to surgery for an ovarian or uterine cancer, and we remove the reproductive organs, and we remove lymph nodes, and then we do a full assessment of what we removed, um, and we also often have uh, CT scans and PET scans, and we, based on all of that, we kind of make an assessment of what her stage is. And cervical cancer is a little bit different. As we talked about, the burden, the bulk of the burden of disease is in developing countries where we don't have CT scans and PET scans as readily available. And so the way that we uh, stage cervical cancer is actually what's called a clinical staging system. So the physical exam is really what's most important. So we make our determination based on physical exam, and you're really trying to determine is the disease limited to the cervix or is the disease growing to other organs and can you can you sort of assess that visually with your speculum exam or digitally with your pelvic exam. We do use CT and PET imaging here because we have it available and we find it's helpful. But that actually doesn't affect the stage of cancer, um, but we do use that information in making treatment decisions. So in general, Stage one cancer is disease that is confined to the cervix, and that can be microscopic or macroscopic, meaning you can see it. Uh, stage two is when you start having extension to the vagina, but you're really remaining very close to the cervix. Stage three is when the disease is more extensive and starting to grow out to the sidewalls, often affecting drainage of urine. And then stage four is when the disease is spreading more distantly. Why does stage matter? Well, we know stage is the most important factor when considering prognosis. So for a woman who presents with an early stage or a stage 1A cervical cancer, the outcomes are really favorable. So you know, almost 100% of women will be cured of their disease. For 1B, you know, not, not as high, but still 75 to 90% of the majority of women will be cured. As the stage gets higher, these cure rates drop dramatically. So for stage two, only 65 to 75% of women will be alive at five years. For stage three, only 40% of women will be alive at five years. And then for stage four, only 10 to 20% of women will be alive at five years. So as you can see, even though our rates of cervical cancer in this country are not exceedingly high, especially in the context of other gynecologic and non-gynecologic cancers, the the sort of identification of a stage three or four cervical cancer is absolutely devastating because our overall survival rates for this disease remain very, very low. So how do we treat cervical cancer? So for microscopic or very early disease, we can do a simple hysterectomy. We can actually often also do a cold knife cone biopsy, and that's that procedure I mentioned to you earlier where we're just removing part of the cervix. And there's also something called a trachelectomy where we can remove the cervix but not the entire uterus. For women who have more extensive disease, but it's still confined to the cervix, uterus, or very top of the vagina, we offer a radical hysterectomy, which is removing the uterus and the cervix and some of the tissue that surrounds the cervix. Once the disease is bulky, meaning more than four centimeters, or has started to locally invade other areas, we no longer recommend surgical treatment, and we actually recommend a combination of chemotherapy and radiation and the most common chemotherapy that we use is cisplatin. This is often a very difficult concept for a woman to kind of understand because when a woman is told she has a diagnosis of a cancer, sort of their first inclination, and ours as well, is let's remove it, let's take it out surgically. The issue with cervical cancer, though, is that once the disease is extending to the organs sort of surrounding the area, no matter how aggressive we are with our surgery, we're probably gonna end up leaving micro or macroscopic disease. And if we're leaving disease behind, then that's a woman who would need additional therapy, which would be a combination of chemotherapy and radiation therapy. And what we try to avoid in cervical cancer is what's called multimodality therapy. So the worst thing you could do for a woman is to give her a very big surgery, and then while we're asking her tissue and the, the woman to recover, we're then sort of blasting the area with radiation and chemotherapy because it, makes, it has a tremendously high rate of side effects, one very common one being fistula, which are abnormal connections between tissues, which are very symptomatic and can be very dangerous. And so for a woman where the disease has already started to spread, 
um, or it's called locally advanced, then we recommend just doing chemotherapy and radiation and not doing surgery. And that actually has a similar cure rate to doing surgery and those other treatments, but doesn't have all of the sort of terrible side effects. And then finally, for women who have widely metastatic disease, the goal of treatment is really palliation. Unfortunately, we don't have cures. And this is often, we start with chemotherapy and then we use radiation for symptoms. So for heavy bleeding, radiation can be a very useful tool or for severe pain that's cancer-related pain. But when we're, in, when we're in stage four, we're more talking about sort of palliating symptoms and controlling disease, not curing disease. So fertility is very, very important and comes up a lot with cervical cancer because almost 50% of women who have cervical cancer are diagnosed at less than 45 years, um, which for many women is a time when they still desire fertility. And so we have to be very cognizant of this when counseling patients and when deciding on treatment options. For very early cervical cancers, a cone biopsy where we're just removing part of the cervix um, can cure disease and can also give women the opportunity to have children. I mentioned that we have to be cautious because these women are at increased risk for early miscarriage and early delivery and labor, but we have many, many uh, case series and, and uh, a large experience with women having sort of excellent pregnancy outcomes after cold night cone biopsies. Now we're also offering more and more women trachelectomies, which is removal of just the cervix, and we're kind of studying, you know, there are other options. Can we do a cold knife cone biopsy and do a lymph node sampling on women? Is that sufficient in more advanced disease? And that's an area currently under investigation, and I think we're really, as a field, sort of having a better appreciation for the importance of fertility, so this is an area that's gonna to continue to develop. What about for recurrent or metastatic cervical cancer? So this, the treatment options I already mentioned, which is the combination of surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation, that's really your frontline treatment. But what about for a woman who um, the disease comes back or after treatment there's still disease when you would hope there'd be none? So our current frontline treatment is chemotherapy. Uh, the main agents that we use are cisplatin, carboplatin, paclitaxel, vinarelbine, topotecan, arenotecan, among others. And there's also been a surgence of targeted therapy. So bevacizumab, also called Avastin, is a therapy that has been FDA approved for cervical cancer that has had some very, very exciting results. You may have heard about immunotherapy, which is getting a lot of attention in multiple different cancer sites. Currently, immunotherapy is not FDA approved in cervical cancer, but early trials do show exciting um, sort of hints that this might be an effective strategy for cervical cancer. One drug, pembrolizumab, is being uh, studied extensively, and so hopefully there'll be new drugs on the horizon. And then there's also multiple other clinical trials going on, but one um, sort of interesting one, there are vaccines. So one is a vaccine that's um, basically adherent to a listeria protein that has shown some exciting early results and now being studied in clinical trials. So in summary, uh, I think we discussed cervical cancer, starts with the HPV infection. There's then this long, long period of cervical dysplasia, and then finally the development of invasive cervical cancer. So there are lots of times for us to kind of, you know, sort of prevent cervical cancer, whether that's preventing HPV or diagnosing the cervical dysplasia before it turns into a cancer, but we have a long period to do that, and that relies on HPV vaccination programs, and that relies on good screening programs. Um, the management of cervical cancer is usually some combination of surgery or chemo and radiation, um, but in the future there's some exciting drugs and vaccine and other targeted therapies on the horizon. That concludes the slides I have prepared, but I am welcome any questions or comments about anything I talked about.